Hi folks, nanotransformation.com, and this is one of our famous basement lectures on a very sophisticated topic that's created a lot of confusion on the internet around the topic of Morgellons and other kinds of nano diseases that are interchangeably used with the word bio-nanotech and nanobiotech. I want to keep and emphasize here that I am not a microbiologist, nor am I a nanotoxicologist. I would suggest that you look into the work of Dr. Hilda Staninger, Dr. Martin. I want to especially thank uh, the teachers and mentors in my life, including Hilda and others, who during the process of becoming free and clear from serious diseases, which you could consider bio-nanotech and nanobiotech, depending upon where your vector points were and how you were infected. I also want to emphasize that uh, the big M, the evil Morgellons word, has been a master silo or a master category for a lot of diseases with similar symptoms. And this is the concern that the FDA and uh, the CDC and a variety of other organizations have around this topic. Not to say that we're gonna get to the bottom of the things very quickly with those organizations, but I do want you to understand uh, on, on their behalf why it's so sophisticated. Primarily because you're dealing with a lot of classified information and I'm about to show you exactly why. You're dealing with a multidisciplinary approach. The work of Dr. Staninger and others requires uh, an immense amount of skill across multiple categories because you are dealing with a new category of biology, a new category of science, and a new category on the periodic chart. You're actually dealing with an entirely new periodic chart, up to four new periodic charts when you're dealing with pure nanotechnology and in the machine world. So what you're dealing with with nanotechnology, this is basic 101, is a zero to 100 nanometer range of technology and or biointegration, or what's called uh, mechanocompatibility. 1,000 atoms wide or less. Otherwise, you're not really dealing with the pure form of nanotechnology. To make matters worse, even medical doctors and med students and scientists and physicists that I've talked to interchange regularly nanobiotech with bio-nanotech. Even worse, when you go out onto the spin internet, the spin on the internet around the area of Morgellons, you're finding everybody hybridizing and mixing up all kinds of videos from nano machines, from sci-fi, like uh, the day the earth stood still, these little metallic robots that morph into creatures and eat the world in mass. It's called nano swarming. It's a real scientific study. Nano swarming is being studied right now to deal with massive machine factories that deal with multiple clusters, similar to protein clusters and globules, and yet they're made purely out of non-biomolecules, meaning none of the things that they're made of are composed of equal anything that's created by a naturally occurring organism. Okay, so nanobiotech, when you think about nanobiotech, you're thinking about things that do not necessarily have to involve um, objects less than 100 nanometers that are created by naturally occurring organisms. When you're dealing with bio nanotech, when you have bio in front of everything, <clears throat> generally speaking, because these are not interchangeable, but they are used interchangeably even by experts, when you're dealing with bio nanotech, the topic of the conversation, first of all, generally has to do with genetic engineering, almost always, but not always, to further the purposes of biotech, which means you gotta understand what biotech is, and it has to be comprised of things that occur naturally that are byproducts, catalysts, or synthesis, synthesis of biotechnology or biology. So if you were to draw another pie chart of bio-nanotech, you'd see an overlap between biology and nanotechnology. And nanotechnology is the high silo or the uber category. And biology, keep in mind, is made up of several complex subsets that both me and my friend E have also had to dive into under the guidance of other uh, mentors and the rest, such as microbiology, bacteriology, virology. I mean, it's incredibly sophisticated. You're gonna have to cross silos and, and um, connective tissue between the disciplines where professors' tenures are hanging by a thread and they're very myopic and focused in one little category. It's very disjointed and very focused on one little area and funded by international corporations that are very, very focused on their single part. When, when things get put together, you have classified technologies, patented technologies that hybridize these two worlds. For example, biomolecules in the area of bio-nanotech, that is 
things that support the biotech industry. Remember, the biotech industry is made up of big pharma, big agro. Pretty much the bottom line. I mean, there's other things that she, there's other subcategories and subsets and sub silos underneath them, but essentially we're dealing with the two most powerful people, organizations, and agendas on earth. Don't get me started, okay? I'm not going X files on you, I'm just saying fact. However, when you look at the center of the overlap between these, you're dealing with the DNA for the most part. Now, the DNA and the study of genetics for the most part, including agrobacterium, which is a biomolecule, for example, uh, agrobacterium is essentially a process, including the T cell insertion and the, um, the gene gun um, therapy created by agrobacterium to modify BT corn for the big industry. These are all biomolecules. They're just swapping genes and integrating the parts that they want and taking the superpowers of various foods and blueprints within biology to get the ones that they want to manipulate at the nano level within the DNA and the nucleic acid what they need to do. Now keep in mind that the DNA is made up of all kinds of things and you need to understand that nucleic acids, nucleotides, proteins, protein folding, including prions. Challenging is, uh, I put prions over here on biomolecules and you really have to, uh, prions is a little bit tricky because they're, the existence of prions is controversial right now and there's some classified things around them. They're misfolded proteins. Some people believe it's accidental mutations. The question that my friend Bruce Lipton asks is, are proteins alive? Answer for me, in my opinion, yes. But you have to get, there's a lot of arguing about that. Prions are misfolded proteins, okay? And so they're not considered to be really alive. And yet, uh, they're one of the most dangerous pandemics that we have on Earth right now. And it's a whole other topic. Lipids, non-polar, uh, non-water uh, so non soluble substances. These are fats, a huge part of the cell and the operation of the organelle in the cell. Carbohydrates, polysaccharides, the things termites create when they eat um, wood and break it down and they break it down in nature and, and fungus is involved in that whole process. This is all part of microbiology. You would have to create another ring right here and put microbiology on top of biology and biomolecules. Carbohydrates, enzymes, which is related to proteins, these are biomolecules, especially when you're dealing with the DNA, okay? Nanobiotech in its pure form is where you get very sci-fi. When you're dealing with nanoassemblers, nanotubules, if you pull something out of your skin, that's a fiber that grows every time you cut it, we have videos on that, or replaces itself like in a, in a sheath or a steel silk type concept. And the original work was done on this on, by Dr. Hilda Stanninger. I know she'll see this video, so I'm giving her the credit and she deserves, she has an amazing mind and she's the one who's bringing a lot of this nanotech research to the world and uh, for the general public. And she always skirts the line between classified and non-classified. There's a lot of hysteria around nanobiotechnology because nobody understands it. Um, for example, I'm gonna give you an easy way to understand it. If you're not dealing with biomolecules and you're looking at ways to create better products for general industry, you're just in the nano industry uh, and, and you're not necessarily uh, supporting big pharma. Like for example, you're not building a nano machine with nano calipers in the nano factory assembly line, a robot with a gold tipped flagellum that had, because gold, remember, is not a biomolecule. Gold is not created naturally by any known creature, at least on Earth, uh, in a catalyst process or an enzymatic process. Gold, fool's gold is, because it's actually a bacteria byproduct, uh, but gold itself and silver and the rest, when you find these involved in machines like nanorobots, nanoassemblers, nanotubules, like the silicon nanotubulars, those are not created, those are built out of elemental, uh, by the analysis of other things in nature. Zeolites, for example. Zeolites are very small. They come out of volcanoes. There's over 300 different kinds of zeolites. They're anywhere from 50 to 10 nanometers wide. We're talking 20 to 30, sometimes 50 or 100 atoms wide. Zeolites uh, have purposes and can be repurposed as long as they're uh, biocompatible or um, uh, mechanocompatible uh, mecha with other things. Okay, so when we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this and we're going to get into how you want to view the future of nanotechnology and the kind of attitude that you need to go around with, with this idea.